Good afternoon to you, and, and sitting comfortably, I hope you don't do. Please feel free at any stage to stand up, because it would be uh, contrary to the message that I'm giving you to ask you to sit for the entire time. Can I thank Ray's for um, uh, uh, organizing these sessions, and particularly to thank Tony, because she's the first who uh, invited me to, to consider participating um, in today's session. Um, what I want to do is, is to tell you a little bit about sedentary behavior. Um, it's an emerging area of research, and the evidence that is coming out is beginning to show that that simple piece of furniture, the chair, is actually a fairly uh, large enemy of health. And I really want to talk to you a little bit today about the evidence for that and what do we do about it. To do that, I'm going to do four things. I'm going to try to distinguish between sedentary behavior and physical inactivity, because they're two different things, and they very often get confused in, in, in the lay press in particular. To talk to you about some of the evidence we have on what the effects of uh, prolonged periods of sitting are. Um, a little bit of the evidence on how sedentary are our population, and I'm going to draw really upon some of the Ulster studies that have been done with children and with um, uh, students uh, throughout Ireland, and then give you some examples from some of our studies, largely with some of our PhD researchers, on interventions which might help us to interrupt or reduce our sedentary behaviour. So if we look at a continuum of physical activity um, from sleeping with very little movement right through to very vigorous activity, the, there are two behaviors in here that I want to talk about. The first one is physical activity. I think we're all aware of that. And we have guidelines for how much physical activity we should do. And physical activity is divided into light, which is just general movements, um, everyday movements, uh, moderate intensity, which gets us a bit warmer and, and out of breath and, and makes it a little bit more difficult to have a conversation, and vigorous, which is that all-out exercise um, where we're, our heart's beating very fast. And, and all three of those together are beneficial and we have some guidelines to tell us how much of each of those we should do to have good health. However, we also sorry, know that sleep is obviously something that's very rejuvenating and very beneficial to us. However, this middle bit here, this sedentary behavior, the, the bit coded in yellow here, is the times at which we're awake but we're sitting or lounging or lying or relaxing. And it's defined as any waking activity. So I'm not targeting sleep. I'm not asking people to sleep less. But any activity which is waking, which is characterized by very low levels of energy expenditure, less than one and a half mets or, or one and a half times our normal resting metabolic rate. And it's normally in a sitting or reclining posture. There are loads of opportunities in modern life for being sedentary. We have opportunities at work, at rest, at play, and in our transport. Opportunities that our ancestors didn't have. Their lifestyles were very much more active and they spent a lot less time sitting than we currently do. So the evolution of mankind and the progress, what we call progress to the developed world, has created an environment and a society where sitting for prolonged periods is not only acceptable, but it's almost something you have to do. We commute longer distances to work, which generally involves sitting. The majority of us work at desk-based jobs, which involves sitting. And we have a plethora of screens and leisure activities which keep us sitting during our free time. And our grandparents didn't have many of these things. That obviously is going to have an effect. Our body, human body was designed to move, and so if you don't move the body, you would expect it to have some effects. And during a typical day, even if you're a physically active person, so even if you're somebody who maybe gets up early and takes the dog for a 30-minute walk around the park, if you put that aside, the rest of the day, there are continuous opportunities to be sedentary. And if you look at that day, I'm sure it probably it characterizes mine, um, sitting at breakfast, working on the computer, transport to and from work, um, sleeping, an evening meal, watching some TV. So collectively, there are a plethora of opportunities for us to be sedentary, even if you are a physically active person who's meeting the current guidelines. What do we know about the dangers of prolonged sitting? Well, this is where the evidence is beginning to emerge. It's not conclusive yet, but we certainly have some very good and very large studies which are showing that even sitting for two hours straight will begin to cause a decrease in your HDL cholesterol, which we know has a cardioprotective effect. 
It slows down your blood circulation. It increases your blood sugar and it slows your metabolism. Now, collectively, over the days, weeks, months, and years that you do this activity, you are much more likely to then uh, end up with something like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. So these uh, regular everyday behaviors and these short-term acute changes to our physiology has long-term health effects on us. So this is probably one of the strongest pieces of evidence um, from recent years, which tells us the dangers of being uh, sedentary. So if I, if I take you through it, this is um, 53,000 men and 69,000 women who were de diseased free at the start, and they were followed for 14 years. Yeah? During that time, 11,000 of the men died and 7,000 of the women died. Okay? So they were followed through this entire period of 14 years. They were asked how much physical activity they did and how much sitting or sedentary behavior they did. And down the bottom, you will see that they, this is physical activity decreasing. So the people on the left-hand side did the most physical activity. And as we move across to here, these are the least active people, not sedentary activity. This is the all-cause mortality. So this was death from any risk factor at all. So this was any, or from any cause. So this is all-cause death. So this was the rate of death. And then you have, for each of these levels of activity, highly active, moderately active, very inactive, you've got three bars. The first bar is people who only sit three hours or less a day. The hatched bar is those who sit between three and five hours a day. And this dotted bar is those who sit more than six hours a day. First observation is that no matter how active you are, at every single level of activity, sitting six hours a day increased your risk of death. Sitting three hours a day, three to five, increased your risk over sitting less than three. And I suppose the important thing for me in terms of trying to distinguish between physical activity and sedentary behavior is all three of these groups were meeting the current UK guidelines for physical activity. So all three of these were getting 30 minutes a day of moderate intensity exercise, and yet still, if they were sitting for longer, they were more likely to die than if they were sitting less. So in terms of the guidelines, we have guidelines in the UK that are shared by all four countries for the first time, produced in 2011, and uh, about to be revised. And they were from our, our four chief medical officers. I think only two of them are still there, our own um, and, and Sally Davies. And essentially, um, they say that adults should be active for 150 minutes a week at moderate intensity or if you want to exercise a little bit harder or more intense, then you can take that down to 75 minutes a week at vigorous intensity, and that they should do some muscular strength. In the 2011 guidelines, we made only one statement about sedentary behavior, and I think it was a particularly vague one. It says that all adults should minimize the amounts of time spent being sedentary for extended periods, much more vague than the previous statement, which specified amounts and times uh, and minutes, etc. Yeah, and the reason for that is because when we were reviewing the evidence for those guidelines, they commissioned Professor Stuart Biddle from Loughborough to look at the evidence, and he produced a report which said the evidence is there, but it's just emerging. It's not strong enough to tell people that they should only sit for two or three hours or they should break up their sitting for five minutes. We didn't have the figures because the evidence wasn't strong. What I can tell you is that we're currently reviewing those guidelines. The chief medical officers have commissioned a group to review them and we will be uh, writing new guidelines for the end of this year. And I'm confident that we will have much more specific sedentary behavior guidelines because in the last eight years, the evidence base has become much clearer and much stronger. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how sedentary we are. This is uh, one of my PhD researchers, Linda Hegarty, based on our, um, uh, McGee. And she uh, has done a study with um, 
school children, primary school children, and we've measured their sedentary behavior. We have a small device called an active pal. I should have brought one. They're about that size. You can see a picture of one there. And we stick them to the thigh, and they wear them for seven days. And that tells us when the thigh is in this position or they're standing, and when the thigh is in that position or when they're sitting. So it allows us to come up with a really strong um, or a really robust objective measure of um, uh, sedentary behavior. Children, almost depressingly, were spending 9.6 hours a day sitting. So a colossal amount of time sitting. Probably more than you or I sat as a child, certainly more than our grandparents would have sat as children. And a surprising fact is we put the physical activity monitors on their parents and their teachers, and the children were sitting more than either parent or teacher. So we have a, a generation that are becoming very accustomed to sitting. Uh, Linda's now designing an intervention in collaboration with teachers to try to break up the classroom day and do a little bit less sitting. Second study I'm going to tell you a bit about was a large uh, all-island study that we, we took part in, the Student Activity and Sports Survey, um, and it was a collaboration between four institutions um, and some, some statisticians in Wolverhampton. It was an online survey of, in a representative sample of over 9,000 students in 31 higher education institutions. We found that a significant proportion, more than the normal adult proportion, um, of, of our, our student population are meeting the guidelines. So it's over 66% of students in, on the island of Ireland self-report, and there's always a caveat with self-report, but say that they're meeting the guidelines. A big discrepancy between men and, men and women in those guidelines. However, Self-reported sitting time was high, with 71% of students saying that they sat for more than seven hours a day during the weekdays, and that drops at the weekends. They're a little less sedentary, but 56% sit more than uh, seven hours at the weekends. So what determines whether somebody sits or, or doesn't sit, or what are the things that are related, or, or what are the correlates of sedentary behavior? Ulster's been part of a large EU-funded project for the past three years. It finished last year called DEDIPAC, which is the determinants of diet and physical activity. And in that, we also began to look at the literature on sedentary behavior. So we've conducted systematic reviews on the determinants of sedentary behavior in youth, um, in adults, and in older adults. And what I'm going to do on the next slide is just tell you what are the kind of key findings for each of those age groups. For children, the things that seem to be related to sedentary behavior are age. The older a child gets, the more sedentary they become. Family TV viewing. The more TV viewing in your family, the more sedentary you are. The lower socioeconomic classes seem to sit a bit less, or sit a bit more than, than people of higher socioeconomic class. Um, if you have low playground density in your neighborhood, you sit more. And if you have less uh, facilities or equipment available, then that's associated with more sitting. And those who eat in front of the television, uh, are, that's associated with uh, sitting more. In adults, again, age, the older we get, the more we appear to sit. Females are generally, uh, at all ages, more sedentary than males. Those who don't do much physical activity um, are sedentary. Those who smoke, those who use mobile phones a lot, tend to uh, sit more. And those who have less access to green spaces. One of the surprising things is living in a rural area. One would think that living in a rural area would promote physical activity and make you less sedentary. But in fact, the evidence seems to suggest that living in a rural area is associated with more sitting. That's probably mediated by the time that you have to spend in transport to go places. In older adults, we have age, again, education, and again, possibly counterintuitively, having more time, less work, being unemployed or retired, you are more likely to sit more, not less. We did, we've done another study in, in, in civil service where we've looked at people's plans for retirement, and very often people have plans to be more active in retirement. This evidence suggests not. The evidence suggests when retirement arrives that a lot of sedentary behavior takes place and that because you've lost the physical activity of getting to and from work, perhaps walking from the car park, walking from the bus, that in actual fact you become less active. Loneliness, obesity, and in ill health obviously contribute to sedentary behavior. 
So what's going to change this behavior? Well, I think to change such a, uh, an endemic behavior, what we probably need to do is think about all the various levels at which this behavior is influenced. So we have individual level, so people need to understand the concept, they need to know about it, they need to have an awareness or education. There needs to be some social and cultural change because no one in this room has stood up yet and, and stood around because I know what you would feel if you stood up, everyone's looking at me. It's abnormal to stand when everyone else is sitting. I'm in a workplace, an open plan office where everybody sits. But let's not forget that if we were here 20 years ago, several of you would have taken out a cigarette packet, lit up a cigarette and had absolutely no problem. And now socially and culturally, we wouldn't dream of it. So we need some sort of social and cultural change around this area. In terms of the environment, we need to allow people to stand. And in a workplace, that simply means having height adjustable desks or at least meetings where we have an opportunity to stand rather than to sit all the time. At policy level, we need to think about how we organize our schools, our workplaces, our colleges, our residential care facilities, and what provision we make to encourage people to stand up. Another PhD student has tried an intervention. This is Aoife Stevenson's work, and she is getting near the end of her PhD now. And she did a systematic review to look at digital interventions. So how can we use the screen technology, which is actually nailing us to our seats, how can we use that as a productive way of increasing our standing? And so Aoife did a systematic review and a meta-analysis, and she went and spoke to a number of workplaces, public and private sector, management and employees, and tried to get a feel for what would be possible. She then worked with our team in computer science and developed an app and we were uh, kindly sponsored by some standing desk people and we got access to portable standing desks which we could bring into the workplace. And so she did a little feasibility trial where we developed a Worktivity app which was put onto either the, the uh, worker's own phone or we supplied them with a mobile phone. And in that app they were asked every hour to report how much sitting they had done. They were reminded and prompted to stand and asked to set some goals. They were given some prompts at various stages. And every hour, they were given some sort of a factoid about sitting or, or, or about physical activity. So things like your cholesterol is, is your HDL cholesterol is going down, your, your blood pressure is changing, etc. And then in some cases, in one workplace, we were able to supply um, an adjustable height desk. So a desk that could be changed from sitting to standing and standing to sitting um, to allow you to continue working without, uh, without uh, w w but being able to stand at the same time without, without disrupting your work. So small study, three work sites, um, and, and these are some of the initial findings. This is only a feasibility study. There's about 20 to 25 uh, workers in each of these three workplaces. So at the start, we see that they have about 12 and a half to 13 hours of um, sitting per day. This was measured with the little uh, ActivePal device. Those that were given uh, no, no involvement in the study, but they were told about it and they consented to be randomized. So they did know a little bit about the purpose of the study and they were alerted to sedentary behavior being a problem. And lo and behold, even that caused them to decrease their physical activity or their sedentary behavior. Those that were provided with just the app on their phone uh, had a decrease. And those who had the app on their phone, but also the opportunity through the, the desk, uh, had the largest of the decreases in sedentary behavior. So a small trial, we were really just testing the feasibility of this piece of research before moving to a fully scaled trial. But it does show that there is potential to change this behavior in the workplace. If you applied some of those environmental changes, such as, 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 as uh, prompts and, and desk, desk heights, to all of the other environment settings, then you could at least begin to try to change us from a sitting society to one uh, that is a standing society. I've mentioned height adjustable workstations. As I say, Linda's looking at uh, using breaks in school and using standing as part of the curriculum and using some standing desks in school. Um, and the other one is healthy meetings. I don't know if, if your life is a bit like mine, but I spend a lot of my time these days in meetings. And almost all of the meetings have enough chairs for everybody, which I always think is a bad thing. I think you should have one less chair than the number of people and do a bit of musical chairs. And I'll share, you can sit down for a while, I'll stand. I think it would be a great thing to do.
Um, but we, we have an abundance of chairs in the university and I go to an abundance of meetings. And so I'm really taken by this from the Scottish Cancer Prevention Network. They ask people who are running meetings to print out this checklist and it's online, and they say, can you tell me how healthy is your meeting? And they say yes and no to a whole lot of questions. So it's an inventory, hand it to the chair of the next meeting you go and ask them, how healthy is your meeting? One of the things they ask you to do is to think about how people travel to and from the meeting. And then they ask, can you have natural breaks between agenda items? as we're kind of doing today, I think after my, my talk, before we move into the rest. Is there enough room to allow people to stand to the side without disrupting or, or, or blocking views? Get the chairperson to lead by example by standing at various stages and moving around the room and uh, obviously be sensitive to ability and disability. So by putting up this slide at the very start of their meeting, the Scottish Prevention uh, Network is asking people to make standing acceptable make it something that is acceptable in, in, in a meeting and acceptable in society, and that is at least a stepping stone towards raising awareness um, of this important danger. So I'm going to leave you with three take-home messages. So even for those who are meeting the physical activity guidelines, so if you're patting yourself on the back thinking, I'm actually quite active, think also about how long you sit, because prolonged uninterrupted sitting produces changes which can damage health. We see that a high proportion of our population spends too much time sitting during transport, work, school, college, and in their leisure time. And changing sedentary behavior is not going to be a quick fix the same way as many of the changes in behavior, and it's probably going to require efforts at individual, interpersonal, environmental, and policy levels. And I know my colleagues later who are experts in behavior change will tell us a little bit more about how we might go about doing that. Thank you. Thank you.